thank you for joining us, all of you. This is your day. It really is. Dr. Dave is actually sitting here ready to expound the Word of God. Take every verse that we put on the screen, get your pen, pad, pencil, whatever you use, ready and write down the references. Can I make a little side note? Go ahead and make a side note. You know note. the phrase you just said, this is your day, which yeah. I know what you're trying to say and what you didn't mean to say, but that's such a statement of, a, of modern Christianity today when the Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made, rejoice and be glad in it. The Bible doesn't ever really say, this is your day. That's our way of telling people, you're something special. You're, but the Bible really, you know, it's all about Him stuff we talked about last week. The Bible tells us, this day is God's day. You, you just exposed so me. To be glad you just exposed me. Now, I knew what you were saying, <laughs> but uh, you know that's how subtly we we lose, we drift off the idea that this is all about God. It's not really about us. There's there's churches who put that on their sign. You I know, love that you're God's favorite and and uh, I love when God's you, on your when side. When you started these whole uh, Bible studies, uh, you kept emphasizing this is about Him. Everything we do is about Him, and you know. When you get that in your mind, that is such a truth because, I mean, I have interviewed thousands of people in these last 35 years, and I would say probably 30% of the books was pointing to me, how you, how you can be all you want to be, Yeah. really. It's natural human tendency. We, we get out of Christianity what will profit us, and then Christianity becomes a life enhancement system of living rather than a, a humbling uh, fall on your face before an almighty God faith, which is what it's really all about. It's about us seeing ourselves from God's point of view, but we want to see ourselves from an exalted man point of view. And, and it, whether you're Christian or pagan, it's human nature. To respond to that, uh, we we want to feel good about ourselves and who we are. We want to get from God, right? Rather than give to God. Yes. Because He owns us, He's bought us. I'm His slave. And we want to get blessings rather than obey. And that's that's why you know today's program on the image of God. That's wh that's why it's so important to understand what it means the image of God. Hey Dave, put up that. Uh, special one we've got, the image of God. That, okay, explain that one, Dave. The title, the image of God, or in Latin, Imago Dei, it means in, in God's image, and that's the reference for our creation. Imago Dei. Imago Dei. You know, that would be a great title for a song. I can almost hear the music, Imago Dei. Can you hear the music? No? <laughs> almost. Almost. It was okay. almost there. I almost had it. Imago Dei. <laughs> In the image of God, well, that would be, wow, that'd be a great... Yeah, and there may be many songs, because it's Latin. There may be old Latin hymns. Somebody know. is going to write to you or email you, which they do quite often. You're getting a lot of mail, aren't you? Yes, and matter of fact, when we asked the people a couple of weeks ago to send us uh, a letter acknowledging that they enjoy the show, we were overwhelmed with their response. Both emails and letters that came in with some great comments people had to make for how to make the show a little bit better and what they really enjoy about the show and how they find it different than other programs. Uh, they were very encouraging and I want to say thank you to all those who took the time to write out handwritten letters to us. Uh, thank you so much. For, it was a great encouragement to me and all those emails we got telling us to keep going and how much you love the program. Uh, I'm going to share that with my church uh, this Sunday. Wow. That's neat. Today, let's go into, uh, you know, let, let me just move from this and help me out, Dave. God is transcendent. Yes. Okay. Uh, what does that refer to? Transcendent means, uh, in generic terms, that it, with no boundaries. It is not limited by whatever the conditions or parameters or protocols of this setting are. So God transcends human existence. So God does transcend. he transcend, we say the image of God, does he transcend an image? Yeah, yeah, we are made in his image. There is an image of God. Now what that means, that, that is the, the identity, the embodiment, the, uh, the understanding of all that God is. We are, we are a reflection of that in some way, which is what we're going to, there's some interesting things about that, what that means. But the image of God means that God exists. It, it tells you there can't be an image of something if it doesn't exist, and God actually is there, 
and we are a reflection of that image. Let, let me read 55, uh, Isaiah 55, uh, 8 and 9. It's in my New Living Translation. If you have a problem with that, then read your translation. Okay, thank you. Uh, he says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Is that transcendent? Yeah, that's a good, a good way to explain transcendence. That it's, it's, it's similar, but, but it shatters the boundaries. Like God has thoughts, but they're not ours. And he has thoughts, and they're higher than ours. So if he says, so when he's saying, you're upset because you can't understand everything, he's saying, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Yes, and he's trying to say, don't try to figure me out or figure everything out. Trust me. I know more than you know. I know everything. I can do everything, and I know exactly what I'm doing, and you never will trust in me. So it's a, it's a statement that, that but should humble us before God. And, and the, the phrase I like in that verse is, my thoughts are not your thoughts. He doesn't just say they're higher than your thoughts. He says you're not even on the same plane. Well, you're comparing apples to oranges. Wow. Like, I don't have a better apple than you. Yeah. I'm an entirely different thing than you are. You know, just to get that concept as you're talking is phenomenal. Yes, yeah. Okay, how about the eminence of God? Is there a, is there a relation there? Yeah, the eminence of God would be the... the, uh, the Profoundness, the the uh, the majestic presence of God, um, that He is He is of such great magnitude that it is beyond our comprehension, and then also the smallness of God, in that He is He can be here inside my body as well as He fills up the entire known universe and all that extends outside of that. Now, where do we get into the everything is God? That's pantheism, God. Everything is not God. God is in everything. Everything exists. The Bible says everything consists of Him, referring to Jesus in Colossians. In Him, everything consists. So when I look up at the vastness of the universe and the sky and the stars, uh, I can't look at that as, that's God. No. No. That's all made by God. But his, his, He is present in His handiwork. He, in some way, his forces are holding it all together. Um, whether the, what, and you know, in physics, they try to explain what is it that keeps these these atoms together when they all should be exploding. The you know, molecules should not be being contained together because they have a positive and negative repelling forces that rotate in them. They shouldn't. They should be always always breaking up. Something is holding it all together. They have yet to identify what that power is that's holding everything together. Well, I think it's Jesus. That's what's referred to in Colossians. In Him all things consist. In Him all things are being held together. Now, you used the, the word Jesus. Should you have used God? No, because Colossians is referring to Jesus in that passage. That's why, see, Colossians was trying to explain to a group of people who were saying, well, Jesus was not God. He was a, a creation of God or an emanation of God. He wasn't literally equal with God. And Paul is telling the Colossians, Jesus is God. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and in him all things consist. So he was exalting wow. Jesus yeah. to that level in our understanding. Um, so Christ's identity as the part of the Godhead is, is uh, not a subordinate role. It, he's equal to the Father, equal to the, equal to the Spirit. So does God only work through natural order? No. No, God works as Jesus did. The miracles usually are things that happen outside of the laws of physics. There's nothing that can explain in physics why somebody with a, uh, um, a cut off ear can have it put back on with the touch of a man's hand. We'd have to surgically put it on. Well, Jesus healed a man's ear who got, got it cut off in the garden. Any of the miracles that Christ did, they, they defied the laws of physics. It's because God made those laws, and God is outside of those laws. He transcends it. That's why God is unaffected by time. God doesn't have to hurry to get there just in time because God is outside of time. Uh, time is us. God is outside it. So, uh, and we are made in that image. Uh, what the early founding fathers, many of them were deists. Okay, we're talking about the image of God. What, what does that consist of? Deists uh, basically mean that they believe in a, a God, 
a personal God who made everything and then sort of set it in motion, but then step back and watches his plan So it's like unfold. winding your watch. And then letting it play out. And letting it play out. And deists don't usually believe that Jesus Christ is God the Son. They believe in a God the Father, God the Creator, God the Architect but not Jesus as being God. But the deists who founded our country, who were part of that, they were biblical deists. In other words, they believed the Bible to be inspired. You know, they all could quote from Scripture uh, better than most preachers And they could. wanted it in schools. Yes, because they, they thought this yeah. was good. They just, some of them just doubted whether or not Jesus Christ was God, but they believed in the God of the Bible. Neo-orthodoxy, we're just getting into some terms, which the image of God, what is that? Neo-orthodoxy? I'm not really sure. It depends on who's defining it. The neo, neo means new. Okay. Uh, orthodox means old and established, the uh, historic, like a, an orthodox Christian, or somebody who believes the same beliefs of the first and second century. The unorthodox, um, uh, Greek Orthodox, are those who hold to the original teachings of the Catholic Church as they see it. So it depends who defines neo-orthodoxy, what they're actually have, to. have the Protestant movement redefined the image of God or as other faiths have not? You know, I don't know. I, I think the, the definition of God and the grasp of who God is is constantly morphing and changing as we drift from Scripture. As we try to become more and more appealing to culture and more and more effective in our outreach, we take the image of God as it's presented to us and we change it so people will want to respond to it. We make God more appealing to human nature. That's why the word fundamentalism is kind of a, f a, f a fear factor now in evangelical terms, right? Right. Yeah, well, back in the 70s, you know, we didn't hesitate to call ourselves fundamentalists. Exactly. But then came Ayatollah Khomeini and the hostage yeah. crisis, right. and they were called fundamentalists. Well, all of a sudden, you didn't want to be called a fundamentalist anymore because words, words change over time. But God never does. The Bible says there's no variableness nor shadow of turning in God. He's always the same. So it, it would behoove us to stay true to Scripture when talking about the image of God, especially how as it pertains to we have been made in that image. We don't know who he is. How do we know who we are if wow. we're off on who he is? Yeah. Let's go to number 19, Dave. Is that the verse? Yeah, we're, one? Going, we're going, uh, going to, there we go, right there. Genesis 1, 26 through 27 reads, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And as a quick reference point to last week's discussion on the gender of God, this is an important phrase. So God created man in his own image. That man means human, doesn't mean males. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, both, are made in the image of God. The Bible doesn't say, and God made males in the image of God. Oh, and by the way, he made some women to go along with it. Women are just as much made in the image of God as are males. So anybody who tries to take and make sex, sexism uh, and, uh, good point. Uh, and, and gender bias out of Scripture doesn't understand the very basic beginning of mankind. God made both genders in his image. So that means both reflect him in some way. Can God call... This is a hot button. A female to preach. Yes, and he has. And there's, there's some in the book of Acts in the New Testament alone. And there's prophetesses in the Old Testament. And let me say this. If whatever my understanding of God's rules are, God can do whatever he wants to do, anytime he wants to do it, through whomever he wants to do it, how many times he wants to do it, for whom whoever he wants. God's will is God's will. But he portrays to us his, um, his um, um, framework through which he works with man in certain ways. And preachers uh, of Scripture and in the book of Acts the, uh, and the four daughters of Philip who preached, who prophesied, um, Deborah in the Old Testament, um, there's, women have been spokesperson. The, the limitation appears to be pastors of churches. When the Bible talks about a pastor, it's, it's in male terms. But a proclaimer of truth 
that you'd be hard pressed to say that women cannot do that. Wow. Okay, let's move on to 20. And I don't know what 20 is on your sheet. Yeah. What it, um, Dave, Dave's got it on his, right there. There we go. Oh, it's, it's down there. Okay. Yeah. Um, our creation is being made in the image of God is important. We are made in the image of God. We are not the image of God. We are made Okay, in it. keep that on the screen, Dave. Help me out with image. Right. Okay, in the image of God, if I look in a mirror, that's giving my image. Then translate that. Well, in, in the verse we read in Genesis, there are two Hebrew words used in that verse for image of God and likeness. The image for, of God, the word is salam, and it means visible representation. Okay. Visible representation. The word likeness is demut, and it means visible similarity. So in some way, the likeness and the image of God that we are, we are in His likeness and in His image. We are visible representations, and we are somehow uh, visibly similar. So, and how are we similar? I, I think the greatest similarity is in our triune nature. We are body, soul, and spirit. And that, that trinity of our existence, reflects the Trinity of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Plus, we have a Trinity of essence. We have emotion, will, and intellect. God has emotion, will, and intellect. So we reflect God. We are we were made in His image of He took Himself and modeled us in very finite, smaller versions that some way reflect His essence, who He is as the divine creator of all the universe. So we are not... Um, that goes back to him being the potter. Yes, well, he's the we potter the clay. and we're the clay. We are made by him. So we're made in that image. But the only one who ever really was the image of God is Jesus Christ. We are made in that image. But Jesus, the Bible says Jesus is the image of God. So there's a difference okay. because he is perfect. Wow. Uh, well, we are made with finite limitations. Let's move to 21, Dave. John 1.14. And the word, which is the... Uh, a pseudonym, if you want to call it, for Jesus, Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ in the flesh, as we looked at him, still embodied the full grace and glory of God the Father, because he was in the image of God. Uh, okay, keep, on, keep that on the screen, Dave. The word became flesh. Why did he put it like that? Um, because Jesus, the word there, the word is the word logos. It's the word we get logistics from, we get logic from. That Jesus is the, is the complete logical, logistical reality of all that is. He, the one who spoke things out into existence, became flesh. Now when we think of that, flesh. that word, word, does that have a, a connotation to the Bible? Yes, the, yes. There's a, he, he is the incarnate word. This is the written word. And so, and it, logos is another word. You could use it for truth. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's a reference to that aspect of logos. I am the logic of all that is. I, I, am, I am truth itself, that he became flesh. Because before that, he was disembodied. So, so in reading this, he became this. Uh, this is a written expression of all the truth that's contained in the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. He is reflected in this. But this is not God. Yes. This is simply the written expression of who he is. Jesus was literally the image of God himself, the Logos. This communicates the Logos to us. Jesus embodied Logos. So it's, it's a... It's a as, as same thing as we are the image of God, but Jesus is the image. This is contains truth, but Jesus is truth. He's all all the truth of all the universe cannot be contained in this book. You can't even write the effects of the events of Jesus' life, John said, yeah. and contain in all the books in the world. Yeah. So all that Jesus is prior to his incarnation, you wouldn't have enough books to contain it. So this contains truth, but Jesus is truth. So there's a fine distinction. Nothing in here is wrong. I don't mean that. But this only contains the truth that God wants us to know. This is the revelation of God. Jesus is the manifestation of God. And that's a, that's a big distinction.
what the term contain and is means the same thing? That is the Word of God, that contains the Word this of God. This is the written Word of God. Jesus is the incarnate Word of God. This is the written Word. Everything in here is inspired by God. But I mean, in terms of all the truth there is in the universe, this contains truth. Jesus is all the truth. So let's say um, this is the Bible. It's that much of the truth in the universe. Jesus is the full glass spilling over. Uh, nothing in here is wrong. Nothing in here is inaccurate. But it doesn't contain every piece of information in all the universe of truth. But Jesus is all of that. Nothing exists outside of Jesus. Let's go to 22. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So those people who want to talk about who is God and what is his image, the answer is it's Jesus. And so the, uh, the great theological concepts and debates of time should always bring us back to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If it misses that, it misses truth. If talking about God takes you off into some other discussion that Jesus is not a part of, is not the foundation, it's taking you into error. It's taking you away from the very foundation of truth, which is what my original uh, child uh, faith was, Christian science. Very theological, very intellectual, very uh, Bible-based in terms of it, use it as its core, but it always drifted away from Jesus because it redefined Jesus as being a great godly man and a great teacher, but the real, and, and a savior, but a savior in a whole different context. Uh, it, it takes the Bibles and it, information and it twists it. Whenever you get away from Jesus, you are getting away from truth. And so in Colossians 1.15, the Bible says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And that right there is a paradox. How do you have an image of something that's invisible? Good point. We don't, want we don't know. There's explain no way to explain it. Explain that one. Other than Jesus Christ is the full manifestation of something that we can't even see, we can't even comprehend. Jesus was the visible representation of it in perfect form. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus born, growing up little boy, being taught by his father to do carpentry work, becoming a teenager, going up through all of the phases that we have. Did his mom and dad know that that was God? Um, you know, that's a great song. That, that's the song that Mark Lowry wrote, yeah. Mary Did You Know. Yeah. We don't know when, what, to what extent Mary understood the full identity of Jesus and when it became apparent to her. We don't know when the father did. We don't know when Jesus, actually, when his mental acuity came to the point that he understood exactly who he was. Was he four? Was he six? Was he nine, 15? We don't know when, when like when he was a baby, did he? Was he, was he all that was, he would ever he talking, be there? Yeah, was he? Was, in, in, in nascent form, because he couldn't talk yet, and he wasn't born coming out of the womb spouting off scripture. So he had to grow to a point where these, what he was could be fully manifested, but he always was, he was the Lord in the manger. He was the Lord in the womb, to the point that when John the Baptist, who was still in the womb, came in contact with him, he jumped in his womb yes. because he was still fully God. But that was the, that's the marvel of the incarnation. How, do you, how can you explain that the creator of the universe and, could even be inside a human body in the first place? And was there a time that he was filled with the Holy Spirit? Uh, no, he always was. He's, he was always one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Was he baptized in the Holy Spirit? He was baptized with the, with the, for his ministry and that symbol of the, of the Holy Spirit coming down to descend upon him. Some interpret that as being that is the Holy Spirit coming to indwell and that's when he became God. That, okay, so he theology. wasn't before that? He wasn't before that, and he becomes God at that point. That's false theology. That's what Paul is trying to uh, debate against in Colossians and Galatians, that he was always and has always been God from the very moment in time he was conceived. Uh, even before that, he was God born from the foundation of the world, that he never was not God. Um, well, but, what, so the disciples that are following him, all these miracles, raising the dead, feeding the 5,000 with five loaves, two fishes, all of the things he did, casting out demons, changing lives dramatically, water into wine, all of that. 
did they know he was God? No. They, they became to understand that as time went on. That's why when he asked Peter, Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, and, and he said, no man revealed that to you. God just revealed that to you. That was an awareness sort of Peter just had. Thomas had it after the resurrection when Jesus said, look here at my hands. And he fell down and said, my Lord and my God. So each one of them had to have their own conversion moment. They were following him as, the, as a David-like Messiah, as a Joshua, as a Moses type of Messiah. They're just a great man God had given them to lead Israel back so to So he greatness. was this prophet. He was a great... Given to them. Yeah. And it, that, over time they began to be aware. See, that, I, I can't get my head around how would Judas betray all of the things he saw. He saw all the miracles. He, he, he was going with them during all of this. Right. And for 30 pieces of silver. Well, that, that's a great point. It's a great distinction because Christianity is, is a conversion. It's not a mental assent to the truth. You can believe Jesus is God and not be saved. If, wow. you, if you're not trusting in him as your Lord and wow. Savior. The devils believe and they tremble, the Bible says in James. They're not saved. They're not going to heaven. And they believe greater than probably you and I will ever believe because they've seen him. They know his power and they tremble in his presence. When was the last time you and I trembled in the presence of oh, God? Oh, I know it. The I, devils that, do all the time. That's what, that's yeah. what I, I mean, when I'm on my knees at night after the day is closing, I've thought of that. I go... I'm on my knees before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Right. I'm praying to him. Why am I not quaking? Yeah, we're just so limited in our awareness. But that's an important distinction. Um, knowing the truth is not the same as trusting in Christ as Savior. It's not the same as being born again. Because okay. conversion is done by God. God converts the soul. I got saved August 19th, 1970, as best I understand, the moment I trusted in Jesus as my Savior. But I didn't convert myself. I didn't change myself. God did it. My response was bursting out in faith. But God changed me. I was born again by the Holy Spirit. I was born again out of an incorruptible seed. I didn't make the change. It's not because I became aware. God did it to me. And then that awareness began to flower out over time. Well, the apostles had the same, and they didn't all get saved at the same time. As they traveled with Christ, it was like the scales began to fall off one layer at a time till by the time he rose from the dead, they all fully believed. It, it, you know, in our, in our way we walk today, I'm just shocked that somebody didn't say, Jesus, are you God? Yeah. It blows me away. Jesus Christ is the answer to every need you may have. Bye-bye.